Okay, uh, we're continuing on here, chapter 13, I think. Uh, we we're talking about acids and bases, and uh, we obviously talked about uh, pHs of uh, strong acids last time. Uh, remember, there's sort of a list of strong acids that you should sort of know. Uh, it's really helpful, hydrochloric acid, uh, nitric acid, perchloric acid, sulfuric acid hydrobromic acid and hydroiodic acid. So again, that list of those uh, sort of six or so strong acids are really good to know uh, because you will help you out as you're doing some problems. Uh, if it's not probably one of those, then again, it's probably more of a weak acid situation, which we got into, I think at the very end last time. And when we do have a weak acid, uh, like say this generic acid, when it does break apart, again, it will mainly stay together, but it will break apart a little bit. And unlike a strong acid that will 100% dissociate into ions, and that's pretty much all you have in a solution, uh, here you do have sort of a mixture of everybody, and that's going to set up an equilibrium. So as we talked about, to sort of solve weak acid uh, pH type problems, it does require an ice table to be done, as we talked about last time. Uh, it really is, as I mentioned at the very end there, I think last time, pretty much the same sort of calculation. Uh, the really only difference is, in a lot of cases, you'll go into the pH equation at the end uh, to calculate the uh, pH of that solution, which means in most cases, this is probably your area of interest in terms of that ice table, and you'd be looking for the equilibrium concentration there of our H+. As we talked about last time, you could still do all the ways that we solved other equilibrium problems uh, if it's available uh, to get to that H plus concentration. Hmm. Any questions on that there? Remember that the strength of a weak acid uh, does increase with uh, an increase in the Ka value. And again, as we talked about, if something has a larger Ka value, that means it should have more products at equilibrium and more products would imply that it has more free H plus in the solution. And that's why it will be a stronger weak acid than um, another weak acid. But once again, in comparison to a real strong acid like hydrochloric acid, it is nowhere near as strong, obviously, as say something like hydrochloric acid, uh, which pretty much just needs to go into solution and it will produce a lot of H plus really, really quickly. Any questions on any of that there? <clears throat> All right, so here's a table and similar to one you have in your book where you may have to, on certain problems, look up Ka values uh, in a table. As we also talked about, uh, Ka values are essentially only for weak acids, uh, and you won't really find strong acids in there. Um, let me see if this table has that, maybe or not. And the reason, again, you won't find a Ka for a strong acid is because it will basically not set up an equilibrium and will 100% sort of break apart uh, into its ions. Um, let's take a look here. So why don't we try one here? Why don't you try one? Uh, what is the pH of a 0.5 molar HF solution? Ka value we'll use is 6.4 times 10 to the minus 4. Uh, so work through it and see what you come up with. I'll do it as well. And okay, let's take a look, see how you're doing. So once again, when you have a problem like this, a couple of things you want to think about. First off, uh, it's an acid. Uh, second off, I see a Ka value, which makes me know that it is a weak acid, right? Because nobody else will have one of those. And that also should tell you how you should approach this problem, which means you should do an ice table. So those are things you want to think about as you come across uh, these type of problems. So uh, we're going to start with perhaps just the weak acid breaking apart. Again, I'm not going to include the water, but if you wanted to, you would just get H3O plus instead of H plus, which is perfectly fine if you want to do it that way. I'm just going to dissociate it like this. Going to set up an ice table in this case, and we have just a 0.5 molar given to us. That means we can assume that we have zeros here of our products. Again, we could also assume that we're heading towards the product side in this case. So we should have some minus X here, uh, plus X and plus X. That means when we reach equilibrium, 0.5 minus X, X and X. 
questions on the ice table here. <clears throat> I remember, you can't go wrong probably in a lot of cases with an ice table. We can write our Ka expression in this case, and our Ka expression would be like any other equilibrium expression. It's going to be our products, which is our H plus concentration times our F minus uh, divided by our HF, and that will equal our 6.4 times 10 to the minus 4. Just like a normal sort of equilibrium problem here, we're going to put everybody from the equilibrium line into our expression. And we want to solve for x, basically. So that will get us basically x squared up on top. Uh, 0 0.5 minus x equals 6.4 times 10 to the minus 4. In this particular case, like we talked about before, uh, you might want to look at the k value here. And it is a small value of k, which means we can assume that x is equal to 0. Why not give it a try? Remember that when we are assuming that x is equal to zero here, we are only getting rid of the x's that we're subtracting or adding something to. And that in this case would be just that x. And that would reduce me down to x squared divided by 0 0.5 equals 6.4 times 10 to the minus four. I'm gonna multiply to the other side and then afterwards take the square root there in that order. And we're going to go 6.4 to the minus 4 times 0.5. Then do a little square root action here, maybe. And that's going to give us an x value of 0 0.017889. Remember, though, that when we do make the assumption, we should always check it, right? And we still need to check it here. Uh, so a reminder to check it, you're going to take the X value you got and you're going to divide it by what you're going to subtract it from and times it by 100. So we'll do that deal right there. And if we do that here, we end up with like 3.5%, which is less than five. So that's going to be a good deal in this situation here. And that means that we can use this X. Really, in this case, we're just interested in the pH, which means if I go back to my ice table, I can see that basically X will equal the H plus concentration. So our H plus concentration in this case does equal X, and that would be 0 0.017889 molar. And now we could go into our pH minus the log of it. And if I do that there, minus the log of that, looks like a 170, call it five, 1 1.75 pH in this case. That is acidic and that is good because it's an acid, yeah. Any questions on that move, yeah. Quadratic, yeah, you can. It should come. It should come out the same, pretty much. Again, might be slightly different with some rounding, depending on where you rounded or so. It shouldn't be way different though. It should. It should really come out about the same. Yeah. So just double check the math and, and that. But you can, like I said before, if you don't want to do the assumption, you should be able to do the uh, the quadratic, and it really should come out pretty close. Again, might not be perfect identical. Uh, depending on where you round versus maybe where somebody else rounds, but it uh, should be pretty much in the same ballpark. Yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> so a reminder, uh, you might want to try this something sometimes as it could save you some time um, along the way here. All right. Now, it is important to remember that you should always check your assumption. Now, for example, let's say we did the same one here. Uh, but uh, we had a different concentration. We had 0 0.05. It would give us really kind of a very similar, obviously, ice table here. And again, just like we did on the previous one, we would take these guys into our Ka expression. Get a 
holds. I don't remember what the value was. Six four to the floor. Six point four times ten to the minus four. So now when we go with our x squared over our zero point zero five minus x equals six point four times ten to the minus four, and we assume x is equal to zero. That will give us a x squared over 0 0.05 equals 6.4 times 10 to the minus 5. Once again, we're going to multiply it and then square root. And if we do that, 0 0.05 times 6.4 to the minus 5 and square root it, going to give us a 0 0.00178889. Uh, eight, eight, which if we check at this point by dividing by what we were going to subtract it from, I feel like, I feel like I missed a zero though. Let me double check here. Point oh five times 6.4 to the minus five. There we go, square root. Am I crazy here? I say 0. 0.5, 6.4 to the 4. Oh, that's right. I should probably hit the right number. I'll try that. Hang on. Probably helps you punch the right Ka value in there. Let's try that again. There we go. That's a little better. So if you actually punch the right number in there, because this should be a four, right? That's better. That is uh, 0 0.00565. Now, if we divide it by 0 0.05 and times it by 100, now we should get what I was going to say a second ago. There we go. Now we got about 11% when we check it. And that is not good. Yeah, so... Uh, you want to make sure that you do check it and also punch in the right number. I suppose don't write it wrong. Um, and it will not always work, obviously. So it's just a good uh, reminder to check. The reason it doesn't work is because of the concentration, right? It has This concentration is a lot less than what we started with in the previous problem, right? So uh, it's kind of like the idea of if you have a sort of bigger concentration of something, uh, the change is going to be a little bit less than if you have a smaller concentration to start with. I uh, liken it to like a pizza. If you have a whole pizza, you take one slice, not a big deal. So got pretty much a whole pizza to go. But if you got like two slices left and somebody takes a slice, that's a much bigger proportion, right? And that's the idea here. There's a much smaller starting uh, concentration. So even that little bit that comes off is going to be a bigger amount of what you started with than when you had a lot higher of a concentration. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Clearly in this case, you would have to then go back and definitely use the quadratic here to solve this if we were going to solve this one. All right, so as we saw here with weak acid problems, they are essentially the same equilibrium problems. The only difference is you're usually interested in that H plus concentration. In most cases, we could ignore the autoionization of water. So what that means is, and we will do that in this class, is we're not going to consider water's sort of contribution to H plus and OH minus uh, in this solution. Uh, because as we talked about before with our KW, they're reacting with each other and producing H plus and OH minus. So we're going to assume in our problems here that in a weak acid problem or weak base problem, that all of the H plus or all of the OH minus comes solely from the acid or base. So we're not going to worry about any of water's contribution to it. And you might see that sometimes in textbooks they do. They'll go, well, this concentration of your acid is way lower than just the stagnant concentration of H plus from water. So we'll go with the pH there for uh, what we got based on water. So we're not going to worry about that here. Again, we're just going to assume that any... H plus, any OH minus that's in solution will come from the acid or base only. And that's going to be basically the contributor to our pH. All right. So let's try another one here. What is the pH of a 0.122 molar monoprotic acid? 
k value 5.7 times 10 to the minus 4. If you don't have a formula, this again is a generic formula for a monoprotic acid. HA has one hydrogen to give, which is why it's called a monoprotic acid. We take a little bit of time and see. What okay, let's take a look. Uh, so again, if you ever need a uh, sort of formula and you don't have one, I can use that HA uh, for a monoprotic. If it's a diprotic, you use H2A, H3A for a triprotic acid. So in this case, uh, we again know that this is a weak acid because we do see the Ka value. So that again should signal you, you should be doing a nice table here. So we're going to set up our acid dissociating here. It will break apart into H plus and a little A minus in this case. It will give us a Ka expression of the concentration of H plus times concentration of A minus uh, divided by HA. And that obviously would equal our Ka value of 5.7 times 10 to the minus 4. 4. Come here. 4. All right. So to do our ice table here, uh, we got our uh, 0 0.122, a 0 there, and a 0 there. So we're not given any information about those guys. That also means it should be heading towards the product. So we'll have our minuses on the left there, our positives on the right. Going to get us a 0.122 minus x, x, and x. Any questions on the table here? <clears throat> We're going to go into our expression there, which will give us x squared divided by 0 0.122 minus x equals 5.7 times 10 to the minus 4. Uh, we could assume that x is equal to 0. And if you did that and you checked it, it is bad. It's like 6.8%, by the way. So the assumption does not work here, which means you do need to go back and solve it another way. And that other way is our favorite thing, which is our quadratic. So we're going to multiply that to the other side. And we will get x squared is equal to... Um, 0 0.0000695 minus 5.7 times 10 to the minus 4x, bringing everybody to one side, x squared plus 5.7 times 10 to the minus 4x minus 0 0.0000, could have done a little scientific notation, I suppose, as equal to zero there. That's going to go into our quadratic at this point. And that's going to get us here. <clears throat> X is equal to minus B, which would be 5.7 times 10 to the minus 4, plus or minus our square root. If you do everything inside the square root, you should get 0. Uh, 0.0002783. And then if you take the square root of it, uh, you should get 0 0.01668. That will all then be divided by 2 times A, which in this case will just equal 2 in this case. That obviously is going to give us our two answers that we get here when we go into the quadratic. If you go the positive way first, uh, you'll end up with 0 0.008055. And if you go the negative way, you'll end up with negative 0 0.008625. Questions on that there. <clears throat> Clearly, we can see pretty easily from our ice table that a negative value here is not going to work, right? Because that's going to give us our negative concentration. So it definitely can't be that because it's negative. Uh, that means that this should be the concentration. And we also see that that will equal, obviously, the H plus concentration, which is really what we need uh, to calculate our pH in this case. So, oops, go that way. Uh, so we'll go here. Like the screen is lower today for some reason. Uh, the H plus concentration will equal 0 0.008055 molar. And we'll go into our pH is minus the log of that number there. And that's gonna get us a pH here of 6.209, looks like, looks like a winner. Not too far off of the assumption, 
but over the five percent rule, which means too far off, uh, and you can't do the assumption. Any questions on that one there? So again, another really good reminder to make sure you do check uh, the assumption. If you choose to do the assumption, um, again, may not always work in all cases. Any questions on any of those steps there? <clears throat> all right, let's try another one here then. Calculate the H plus concentration and let's also do the pH, why not? of a 0 0.01 molar HCN solution. I imagine one of the other answers might be right, hopefully. Okay, so let's take a look. Once again, a couple of things we could get from the problem itself, and sometimes people overlook these things. Again, a KA value telling us it's a weak acid, so that makes the decision of how to calculate the pH and all that pretty simple. You got to go through the ice table, right? So those are, again, things you want to think about as you go through these problems. Uh, so we will uh, do our little equation here of our acid breaking apart into H plus and CN minus, in this case, a little cyanide. Initially here, we got uh, 0 0.01, it looks like. Zero and zero, our change will be minus x uh, plus x plus x. That means when we get to equilibrium, 0 0.01 minus x, x, and x. This will go into our Ka expression, which will be our products divided by our reactants. And in this case here, that will give us x squared divided by 0 0.01 minus x will equal our Ka value of 6.2 times 10 to the minus 10. That's a fairly significantly small K value there. So I'm going to do my assumption here and hope for a better outcome uh, that X is equal to zero. And if we do that, that will give us X squared uh, 0 0.01 is equal to 6.2 times 10 to the minus 10. Once again, we're going to multiply and then square root. And if I do that, we will end up here with Looks like uh, 2.5 times 10 to the minus 6. Again, we do need to check it. So to check it, we were going to divide it by whatever we were going to subtract it from, which is that number. So we'll take that, divide it by 0 0.01, times it by 100%. And I think you're good. I don't even think you're anywhere even near 1% in this case. Uh, so you're like uh, 0.002%, so you're really good in this case. So the assumption is good, which means, again, based on our ice table, that right there should be our H plus concentration, which looks like in our choices there, it would be number two. And since that is our H plus concentration, if we did want the pH here, that is what we should go into our pH equation with... And if we did that there, like a 1.60, I believe, which is also acidic. And that's good because this is an acid here. Yeah. <clears throat> any questions on any of those steps there? So again, uh, make the assumption and hope it works. And it can save you some time, make it a little bit quicker of a problem. Any question on weak acids, how to deal with weak acids? Pretty much the same thing as a normal equilibrium problem. Just sort of that additional thing of the pH equation. Any questions? All right, then let us talk about another uh, idea here with acids. And that is what is sometimes referred to as percent ionization uh, or percent dissociation, but most people will call it percent ionization. Uh, when we calculate percent ionization and we take the concentration of the ionized acid uh, divided by the initial concentration times 100, frankly, when you calculate percent ionization of an acid, is the exact same calculation as you do to check your assumption. You basically, it's the exact same calculation. Take the H plus concentration divided by the initial concentration and times it by 100. 
and that will get you your percent ionization. If we have a strong acid, it would be 100% ionized, which means, again, it's going to completely break apart. All you have in solution are ions. And as we have weak acid, we can see uh, we have some high ionization here and a little bit lower here. The difference between this point here and this point over here is what? The concentration. So the percent ionization is dependent on the concentration. It is sort of that pizza example I just gave a second ago. At the far end here, we have a really small concentration, which means any little bit of it that comes off is going to be very significant. And that's why your assumption doesn't work in some cases and why we go with 5%, uh, because that amount of change is too significant based on where you're starting with in terms of your concentration. As opposed to over here where we have a much larger concentration, the percent ionized is not as much and is not as big of a factor. And again, that would be like your whole pizza where you take a slice, not a big deal. But again, on the other end here at the beginning, you only got like two slices, take one, you just took 50% of it, right? So, because you only started with a very small amount. So the amount of the concentration there is really important in terms of the percent ionization. And is also really why certain times your assumption will work and other times it won't. Like we saw with the HF example, at 0.5, we were good. At 0.05, not so good. As soon as I got the right numbers up there, we were not so good. Um, and that, again, is because it was a much smaller concentration at that point. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so let's take a look at this problem here together and sort of see... Um, screen there. Uh, let's take a look at this one. We have eight molar formic acid and it is 0.47% ionized. What is the Ka value here for formic acid? So we know a couple of things for formic acid. It's a stronger weak acid. It is because we're looking for a Ka value. So definitely it's a weak acid. So, you know, not sure. Maybe an ice table would be a good thing to maybe roll out there and sort of see what's going on. Uh, so if we did an ice table here, we have HCOOH, which is our formic acid. It's going to break apart into H plus and a little bit, dare I say, formate. I'm going to go with here. We initially have eight molar here of our formic acid. We have none of these guys. Change would be minus X plus X plus X. That means at equilibrium, we have eight minus X, X and X. If we were to write our Ka expression for this acid, it would be like normal or products over our reactants. So a little H plus, right? And our formate divided by our formic acid. And that equals, I don't know, because that's what we're trying to find. So normally at this point, we would take our equilibrium line, right, and toss it in there, and we would solve for X. But in this particular case, we can't do that because uh, we are trying to find the Ka value. So this is where the other piece of information in this problem is kind of important. We do have the percent ionization of this acid, which is 0.47%. And we know that the percent ionization is equal to the H plus concentration divided by the initial concentration of the acid times 100%. So uh, we know the initial concentration of the acid is eight. We know the 100% and we know the percent ionization. So we could actually use the percent ionization to figure out the amount of H plus there is in the solution at this point. Uh, that would mean that we have 0.47% uh, is equal to the H plus concentration divided by our 8 molar, which was our initial concentration, times 100%. We're going to multiply 8 to the other side and divide by 100, right? So we're going to take our 8 to the other side. And we're going to come through and also divide by 100%. And that will give us our H plus concentration. So if we do that, well, 8 times uh, 0.47 divided by 100, going to give us here 
point zero three seven six. So I just figured out my H plus concentration is 0 0.0376. That's important because if I go back to my ice table, what is that equal? That's H plus. And what I just calculated is this guy, right? And that guy is X, right? And now that I know that X, that is the same X that would be there. And that would be the same X that would be there. So kind of very similar to the equilibrium experiment we did, right? We kind of work backwards in the ice table. Um, so here we could use that percent ionization to figure out the H plus concentration at equilibrium, which from our ice table here, we could see is basically all of our X values. So now we could actually get numbers for all those guys at equilibrium. So we know that the H plus would be 0 0.0376. So would our formate. And our formic acid at the end here would be 8 minus 0 0.0376. And that's going to give us here, I'll call it 7.9624. Now I have actually all three of these values that I can now plug into my Ka expression. And if I do that, my Ka would equal basically 0 0.0376 squared divided by 7.9624. And that will get me a Ka value here of something, 9624. About 1. 1.8 times 10, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 4. So here we were able to use our percent ionization to figure out our H plus concentration, which from our ice table basically is all of our X values. And that will allow us to figure out what everybody's equilibrium concentration is uh, there. And now we can get to our Ka. Any questions on that one there? So this is obviously a little bit more involved percent ionization. You could just be asked to calculate the percent ionization of an acid or a base as well. If you were doing a base, it would be the amount of OH minus that is free versus the amount of base concentration you started with. Any questions on any of that there? <clears throat> All right. So uh, the next thing we're going to talk about here is I'm going to say weak acids, I feel. I feel like that's coming up. There it is, weak acids, weak bases. So we've talked about weak acids. We're now going to talk about what we do with weak bases. And it might not be much of a surprise at this point, but it is essentially the same thing we do with weak bases. So because weak base, weak acids and weak bases are both equilibriums to get set up, uh, we could write an equilibrium expression. So this is our ammonia, which is a weak base. And again, it's going to accept the H plus there from the water. It will give us our equilibrium expression, which we call a KB for base, added to our ever-growing list of K values of KC, KP, KW, KA, KB now. Um, just like our KA, um, our KB, as the value of the KB increases, so does the strength of that weak base. And it's really the same reasoning. If we have a large KB value, that means when we reach equilibrium, we should have mainly products. And on our product side, we have free hydroxide there. So we should have more free hydroxide floating around in the solution. And it would again, make it a stronger weak base versus another weak base if you were comparing those. Just like uh, weak acids, and strong acids, uh, you will not find a KB value for a strong base. And the same reasoning applies. If it is a strong base, it's going to 100% break apart into ions like potassium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide. You will not have it setting up an equilibrium. Uh, so again, that is another way that you can recognize something being a weak base. If you see a KB value, it's a weak base. Yeah, And as we talked about, I think the other day as well, 
pretty much your lithium, sodium, potassium, hang right. Calcium, strontium, barium, those guys with hydroxides are your strong bases for the most part. Um, and again, um, definitely see that KB value. It's going to be a weak base. The only difference is when we look at the ice table here, which is also what you need to do, there is no H plus concentration, right? There is only OH minus, which means the difference here when you do these type of problems is you're going to most likely first calculate our friend POH first, subtract 14 and get yourself to the pH. So this one would usually will end up getting to your POH and probably the easiest way at that point would be to take 14 minus it and get yourself to the pH. So that's also something to remember when you're solving a weak base problem that you don't get the pH directly from the result of that like we do with a weak acid because we have H plus this present, which I think is what that guy is yelling about right there. Yeah, so, so any questions on that there? <clears throat> All right, then uh, here's a table. And again, you might have to reference a table in your book to find some KB values. Let us try one here. We have an amine, uh, ethylamine, uh, has a KB of 5.6 times 10 to the minus four. What is the pH if you have a 0.15 molar solution of it? So calculate it up. Okay, so let's take a look and see how you're doing. So again, a couple of things that we could get from this. Uh, obviously we are given a KB value. So that should tell you this is a base and it is a weak base. And again, that means probably down the road of an ice table here. Um, <clears throat> so you might want to start with the equation. As we talked about, I think, uh, the other day, definitely when you're writing equations with uh, a weak base, probably those are the good ones to include the water. It just helps people sort of visualize sort of what's happening, uh, that this guy is going to basically grab it out, right? The H+, plus, uh, that will get you your C2, H5, NH, and I'm just going to add the H there at the end, and it will become plus as it is the H plus that's coming over. And that will leave our water, and that's really where we generate our sort of OH minus from in this particular case. Any questions on that equation there? <clears throat> now we just want to approach this the same way. Uh, we're going to take our initial, which is uh, 0 0.15, 0 and 0. Our change here will be minus x, uh, plus x, and plus x. Our equilibrium here will be 0.15 minus x, x, and x. Why did I not do anything with water? Yeah, because it's not including the equilibrium, right? So no sense putting extra stuff there that you might use incorrectly or not really need to use. Uh, we could write our KB expression in this case, uh, which will be our products, uh, which is this guy here, it looks like. Divide by our reactants. And that equals our 5.6 times 10 to the minus 4. We uh, can put our equilibrium line into there, and that will get us a x squared uh, divided by 0 0.15 minus x equals 5.6 times 10 to the minus 4. Uh, you could assume that x is equal to 0 here, and of course you are a professional, so you know that is not a good assumption, right? And that's like a... 6.1% in this case. So again, this is another situation where we do need to kind of go back and solve it another way. And if you are not checking your assumptions, make sure you do check your assumptions. Yeah. Uh, we're going to multiply what's on the bottom here so we can solve it another way to the other side. And when we do that, that will give us x squared is equal to 8.4 times 10 to the minus 5. Uh, minus 5.6 times 10 to the minus 4x. Bringing everybody to the same side gives us our sort of quadratic here of uh, x squared uh, plus 5.6 times 10 to the minus 4x minus uh, 8.4 times 10 to the minus 5 equals 0. 
So that's going to give us our A, B, and C that we need to go into our quadratic. And that will give us a X is equal to minus B, which will, uh, in this case, I feel like there it is, minus uh, 5.6 times 10 to the minus 4. Plus or minus, once again, if you kind of do everything inside the square root before you square root it, you should end up with like 3.363 times 10 uh, to the minus 4, which upon doing the square root will leave you a 1.834 times 10 to the minus 2. That will all then be divided by 2 times A, which in this case is basically 2 times 1. That's, again, going to give us our two values here. Uh, going the positive way first, the adding, will yield us a 8.89 times 10 to the minus 3. Going the subtraction route uh, will yield us a negative 9.45 times 10 to the minus 3. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Just like previously, we are really interested in our hydroxide here, uh, which does equal X. So clearly, in this case, the negative is not the choice. So that would mean that our positive guy here is really what we want. We also want to remember that that is the hydroxide concentration and not the H plus concentration. So I know it's hard to see on the bottom there. So I'm going to go up back up here to the top here. Uh, so because that will equal our hydroxide concentration, our OH minus concentration will equal 8.89 times 10 to the minus 3. That again could go into our POH equation. And if you do that there, uh, that's going to give you a 2.05 which if by some chance you did think was the pH, uh, again, should not make sense to you because we're dealing with a base, right? And that's clearly not a basic pH. Uh, so we will then get our pH by taking our 14 minus our pOH, uh, which will get us 14 minus 2.05. And that's going to get us an 1195, which definitely is a basic pH, yeah? Any questions on that there? <laughs> so once again, uh, pretty much same calculation. Again, just these slight differences that you got to remember as you're going through these problems to make sure that you adjust. The adjustment here is when we do get that X value is the hydroxide concentration. You got to first get that POH and then probably to the pH. And again, as opposed to in a weak acid where we go directly kind of into the pH. Question on weak uh, we basis type problems here. <clears throat> no questions? Good. All right. Then let's talk about the relationship between Ka and Kb. Uh, so this is the dissociation of a Ka, weak acid, which we can write our Ka expression for. That is basically an equation for our weak base. And if we were to add these two values together, or add these two equations together, we would cancel out things that are the same. And what we would be left with there, dare I say, is something that we saw before that looks like water basically. Yeah. And water also has a K value, which is our KW. So we know that when we add equations together, we do what with the K values? We multiply them, right? So the good relationship to know is this one right here, which is the KW which is still that one times 10 to the minus 14 number we used earlier, is equal to the Ka times the Kb. Now you may be wondering, why do I need to know that? Uh, because it's useful. And also because there will be certain problems where they will give you the wrong K value and you need the other K value. So they'll give you the Ka value when you actually need the Kb value to do the calculation correctly, or vice versa, they'll give you the KB value when you actually need the KA value. So uh, this is a very quick way that you can get the KA or KB value. Also, perhaps maybe you can't find a KA or KB in the table, but you can find one of them. 
So you could use this to figure out what the other value would be if it's monoprotic. Uh, that'd be much easier to do. Uh, so we will definitely see this when we talk about salts and hydrolysis. Those are very common problems where you're given, frankly, the wrong K value and people always use the wrong K value. Um, and you just, again, has to understand that you need the other one. And this is the way that you could go from one to the next. Kind of like uh, when we use it in our KW, it's the same uh, same calculation, regardless of which one you're looking for. You're basically going to take one times 10 to minus 14, divide by either KA or the KB value, uh, depending on which one you have. Uh, we definitely will see that shortly uh, in this chapter here. But before we do here to finish up here for today, perhaps uh, we'll talk about a little bit about acid strength. And when we talk about acid strength, um, there's two types of acids that you may be familiar with. And it's basically the same idea as how we name acids. It's all based on whether or not there's oxygen or not. So in a case where we do not have oxygen, uh, you may think that the overwhelmingly uh, determination of which one's a stronger acid would be something like electronegativity. Uh, and it's actually not. It's actually when we're dealing with acids that do not have oxygen, it is the bond enthalpy, uh, which is the bond strength, basically, uh, that determines which one will be a stronger acid or a weaker acid. So most of our kind of acids with uh, no oxygens are group seven here, our HF, our HCl, and our HBr, and our HI. And these are the bond energy, which is basically the energy needed to break those bonds. And we see before I scribbled on it there that HF has the highest bond enthalpy, which means it takes a lot more energy to break that bond than say our friend HI, which has a lot lower of a bond energy. Why is that important in terms of acid strength? What is What makes something an acid? The ability to do what? To produce H plus, right? So that means at some point you gotta break this bond. So if it takes a lot less energy to break this guy's bond, he's going to release his H plus a lot easier than it is for this guy, which is going to make him a much stronger acid than, say, HF, which it takes a lot more energy to break, which means he's going to hang on to it a lot longer and not going to release as much here. So as we look here at this table, the bond strength increases as you go up group seven which means the acid strength actually increases as you go down group seven, as this is the easiest bond to break, followed by this guy, this guy, and this is the hardest bond to break there, which is HF, yeah. yeah acid strength goes up. It does, because that's going to allow that H basically to be popped off a lot easier. Yep. Other questions? <clears throat> yeah. So that is, again, sort of the overwhelmingly thing that we look at when we're dealing with this type of acid that pretty much does not have oxygen. We look at bond enthalpy or bond strength. And again, as was just said there, really the stronger the bond, the weaker the acid is going to be. Uh, the weaker the bond, the stronger the acid is going to be because of the ability to basically release that H+. So HF is much weaker than HI. And that's why those three there to the right are our strong acids, right? Hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, and hydroiodic acid. Um, and actually, a hydroiodic acid is stronger because it has a much weaker bond energy than even hydrochloric acid. People kind of think like hydrochloric acid is always like the top one there. Uh, but it's actually it increases as you go down. And that's what we see here as well. Now, when we look at acids that do contain oxygen and these guys are sometimes referred to as oxy acids uh, because they contain oxygen there's really going to be two different things that you would look at when you're trying to assign sort of acid strength or comparing acid strength one would be electronegativity right and electronegativity is the ability of an atom to bring electrons towards itself, right? Increases as you go this way on the periodic table, right? Decreases as you go this way. The most electronegative element is? Yeah, I would agree with that if I get her in there. Uh, oxidation number, our oxidation state, you might remember for maybe 200A when we did all that redox stuff, right? That's basically the charge that uh, these guys undertake really based off of how they're sharing electrons and who they're sharing electrons and really kind of the difference in electronegativity. 
So it does depend on uh, one of those two things. And the bond that in most cases with oxy acids we're breaking is this OH bond. And that's a polar bond, right? The oxygen is more uh, negative and the hydrogen is more positive. So it's weakened to begin with. And that is the H that's going to basically come off and make it an acid in this case. So the first type of oxy acid that we look at is one where we have different central atoms, but they're from the same group and have the same oxidation number. So if you're not remembering how to do oxidation numbers, a quick lesson on it. Oxygen is a good place to start. It is minus two, minus two. This would be minus two. Hydrogen is plus one. So that's a two, four, six, and a plus one is a minus five. And they balance it out here. The chlorine in this case actually has an oxidation state or number of plus five. A reminder, and we will remind each other of this later on in the semester when we get to electrochemistry, uh, oxidation states are not necessarily the same as the charge that you might associate with a metal and a non-metal when they're in an ionic compound. This is typically what we see when they are covalently bonded sharing of electrons. And because in this case, the chlorine is sharing electrons with all those oxygens, uh, it's going to actually take on a more positive sort of charge in this arrangement uh, rather than the normal negative one charge we associate with an ionic compound. Same thing over here for our friend uh, bromine. Uh, minus two, minus two, minus two, plus one for the hydrogen. Also going to yield bromine a plus five charge oxidation state. So since our central atoms have the same oxidation number, we clearly cannot use that as the determining factor of which one's going to be stronger because they both have basically the same positive pull right there on the central atom. In this case, we look at the difference in the electronegativity of those guys. And electronegativity increases as we go up, which means essentially what's going to happen here is this chlorine, the electrons are heading in this direction to begin with. This chlorine is going to go keep on coming towards me because I want your electrons. And what that's going to do is essentially continue to weaken and weaken this bond. And it's going to allow that H plus basically to pop off a lot easier than the electronegativity pull from the bromine, which will still pull it this way, but not as much. So when you have this same oxidation number on the central atom in an acid that contains oxygen, uh, you look at electronegativity of that central atom and the one that is a higher electronegative atom would be the stronger acid in that case, because again, it's going to weaken that OH bond a lot more and going to make it a lot easier for our H basically to pop off in this case. Question on that there. <clears throat> now, the last type of oxygen or oxy acid that you deal with is one where we actually do not have uh, a difference in electronegativity because they are the same central atom. So in this case, when looking at hyperchlorous, chlorous acid, perchloric acid, and chloric acid, they all have chlorine as their central atom. And here we would look at the oxidation numbers. So if we did it really quickly here, uh, that's a minus two, minus two, plus one. Uh, that's going to give our chlorine here a plus three. This guy's going to be minus two, minus two, minus two, minus two, and plus one. So that's a minus eight plus one gives our chlorine here a plus seven. This is basically the guy we just did a second ago. And that's going to give our chlorine a plus five. And that's going to be minus two and plus one, uh, which will give this chlorine a plus one. The idea here is kind of the same idea. This guy over here has the greatest oxidation state, right? Which means it has the greatest positive charge. And it's going to essentially bring those electrons closer in. And it's going to weaken this bond and allow it to come off a lot easier than the pull that this guy is going to feel from that plus one charge. So the acid strength will basically increase with increasing oxidation number. So in this case, the perchloric acid would be the strongest, followed by chloric, chlorous, and then hypochlorous uh, would be the weakest of the acids. So... With oxygen involved with your acids, you either look at electronegativity if there is no difference in oxidation number. And if there's no difference in electronegativity, you look at oxidation number of the central atom. 
both is basically uh again the sort of larger value there is going to uh, be the stronger asset question on comparing acid strengths all right we